to get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. As you can see on the screen, the topic is pelvic floor physiotherapy for the management of bladder leakage, erectile and erectile dysfunction, following prostate cancer treatment. So speaker today is going to be Christine Jedadiski, who is a registered pelvic floor physiotherapist. She treats men and women and children suffering from pelvic pain and bowel and bladder dysfunction. She has a special interest in men's pelvic health. For over 22 years, she has worked as an exercise specialist and helped injured military personnel, chronic pain sufferer, sufferers, <laughs> patients with neurological impairment, spinal cord injuries, and cancer survivors. She's a strong believer in integrating rehabilitative exercise into patient treatment to not just treat existing conditions, but also to prevent new injuries and or debilitating and embarrassing conditions. Christine has a master's in physiotherapy and a bachelor's degree in kinesiology, as well as an applied clinical research degree. She's currently pursuing a PhD in rehabilitation science at McMaster University, looking at the effectiveness and superiority of a pre-operative biopsychosocial model of care sure. management, post-operative incontinence and erectile dysfunction in men who've had a radical prostatectomy. Now I can go on because she has a very large bio and very interesting but I'm going to turn it over to Christine and she can tell us all about herself and the topic. Christine. All right. Thank you so much, Ken, for that introduction. Uh, I also wanted to extend a big thanks out to Winston for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, he brought to my attention that there is a growing awareness amongst the community, uh, community that uh, pelvic floor physiotherapy is, in fact, important for the management of bladder leakage and erectile dysfunction following prostate cancer treatments. So that's exactly what we're here to talk about today. Now, Ken has very kindly uh, provided uh, a, a fairly thorough synopsis of my uh, bio, so I won't go into too much detail about it, other than uh, I do have special interest in men's pelvic health, and that came um, with uh, several of the uh, professional opportunities that were provided to me. And I had the opportunity to work with some of the, uh, well, one very specific uh, world-renowned surgeon, Dr. Bobby Shagan, which I'm sure many of you have uh, perhaps heard of. And he essentially took me under his wing, uh, letting me spend days with him in clinic, observing him perform these robotic-assisted and open laparoscopic procedures, uh, and then encouraged me to pursue my doctoral studies so that we can advance the uh, current health care that's uh, being provided for men who are undergoing these types of treatments. And uh, yes, I am looking very specifically at the prehabilitation focus. Uh, much of the research that's been conducted thus far has focused primarily on the post-operative care, but of course, there is a huge role in the preoperative uh, capacities of providing appropriate health care that not only considers the biomedical factors such as pelvic floor muscle training, but also the psychological challenges that many of these men uh, may experience uh, certainly preoperatively and, and thereafter. I also have interest in a technology, a new technology that's uh, come out over the last decade. It's called high intensity focused electrical magnetic stimulation. And this is a non-invasive treatment option for uh, for pelvic floor muscle strengthening. And there is only one study to date that's been conducted on the effectiveness of this type of treatment for men who have undergone prostate cancer removal. And the, the results are, are fairly compelling, but again, the research uh, was only done with a small number of uh, participants and, and done from the manufacturer themselves. So of course you have to take that with a grain of salt. And so I'm looking at uh, generating some more compelling evidence on that topic. I'm also the owner and founder of New Life Physiotherapy. We offer virtual and in-clinic appointments. So for those who can't travel to Ancaster, which is where we're located, uh, we can certainly provide you with the virtual options. Okay. So 
Today's presentation objectives are going to discuss the following three things. We're going to look at why bladder leaks happen, as well as why erectile dysfunction occurs after prostatectomy and radiation therapy. Then we're going to talk about how exactly pelvic floor physiotherapy can help with the management of bladder leakage and erectile dysfunction. And then finally, we're going to end with um, an active participation, hopefully from everyone in the room today, on how to implement an evidence-based exercise protocol for the management of these conditions. So as a way of getting us started, many of you are probably aware of the various types of cancer treatments available. And of course, today's topic is going to focus primarily on the first two, which are the radical prostatectomy and the radiation therapy. But for those who are undergoing hormonal therapy, for example, this talk is still very much pertinent to you as uh, the research shows very clearly that anytime that a man is taking this type of therapy, the muscles waste away, particularly in the limbs, but it is very much uh, likely that this is happening in the pelvic floor as well. And as you'll come to learn, the pelvic floor muscles are going to be a very important part of your uh, function, especially after the removal of your prostate and or exposure to radiation. So you'll want to stick around to listen to how you can also uh, strengthen your pelvic floor muscles despite being on this particular type of therapy. And then number four, the local therapies, uh, the cryotherapy and the, the HIFU, as many of you maybe have heard, are at this point, uh, they, they're unpredictable in terms of how localized they can be. So the, the damage that they can do to the surrounding tissues is unpredictable. There's a high recurrence rate and uh, they are still very much in their experimental stages. Now, if you're going to learn how to strengthen muscles, it's important to know your anatomy. And this here is essentially a picture of the various layers of the pelvic floor. And the first layer, I'm also gonna just show you if you can see my image. Uh, this is a 3D model of what we're discussing for those who are unfamiliar with the pelvic region and the pelvic floor muscles. And uh, the bottom layer, which is the layer that would be underneath my hand, uh, these muscles here, and I'll go back to the screen, these muscles here essentially become the shaft of the penis. So they are responsible for sexual function. Um, the ability of these muscles to contract fast and with rigor or with strength will intensify the um, pleasure one would have with sex and also the ability to sustain uh, an erection over time. The second layer is the continence mechanism. And this one is essentially sandwiched between the third and the first layer. And it's a circular muscle that wraps around the urethra, which is the tube through which the urine passes out from the bladder. And it closes down on the urethra to prevent urine from escaping. Now, the interesting thing is that this layer, along with this center muscle here in the muscles of sexual function, they work simultaneously to improve that continence mechanism. And I'll show you exactly how in just a moment. The third layer is the deepest layer. And this is the layer that we would find located inside. That we would locate inside. Uh, and that layer has various functions, including supporting the internal organ. So for men, it would be the bladder and the rectum and the former prostate, or if you're exposed to radiation therapy, it would still be there. Um, and beyond supporting the internal organs, it also acts to stabilize the pelvis. So uh, the pelvis has in it hip muscles that insert into the side. And so beyond stabilizing the pelvis, we also have to think about the effect it has on the hips and providing stability for the hips. And it also provides stability for the spine. And I say that because if you happen to be somebody who has back issues or hip issues, then we know that your pelvic floor muscles may not be working at their best because they're under the influence of those structures. And so it's important to always consider those two things should you be struggling with uh, achieving optimal pelvic floor function. Now, another really important function that is often overlooked is the sump pump mechanism. And that mechanism is essentially how well the pelvic floor muscles stretch when you inhale and how well they contract or recoil when you exhale. The pelvic floor muscles work with the diaphragm. And so when the diaphragm contracts, that's the huge muscle of respiration that lives above the pelvis. And when it contracts, it creates a pressure that causes a reflexive lengthening of the pelvic floor muscles. And so the two muscles work together like a piston. 
Now, if that system is not working well, and nine times out of 10, most people, when I assess them, they breathe very shallow, that affects how well that pelvic floor moves. And if that pelvic floor isn't stretching and contracting or recoiling through its full range of motion, we get something called venous congestion, which is a backup of fluid that pools in this space. And that then can put more pressure and irritate the structures that reside within the cavity. Not an optimal situation. And so on May 26th, and I'll remind you at the end, I am hosting a free workshop for those who are attending this webinar tonight so that you can learn more about how to optimize the function of your pelvic floor, thinking about the role of the diaphragm in optimizing that function. <clears throat> I've included this slide because I understand there are some uh, women that are attending today in, in support for their partners. Um, and I just wanted to make clear that the information I am providing today is also pertinent to women. The anatomy holds true for women. There, the only difference is that there would be a slit uh, in the muscle of sexual function uh, to accommodate for the vagina. And then, of course, in the middle layer, we have a couple extra muscles that surround the urethra and the vagina just to provide more stability. So that's really the only difference. And so when I'm going to be teaching the various exercises today, um, ladies, you can also uh, participate and try to uh, strengthen your pelvic floor muscles as well. There are a number of conditions that women are afflicted with beyond incontinence, incontinence being the biggest one, particularly in that postpartum period, or even the postmenopausal period when estrogen disappears, the women or women tend to be afflicted with a number of other conditions thereafter. There can be things like urgency frequency with urination, constipation, painful sex, and in children even, uh, which um, I also do uh, some work with. Uh, we, we deal with things like bedwetting and constipation and, and various other congenital deformities. Okay, so back to the men. So this is an image uh, from uh, Paul Stratford and Ryan Hodges, who are leading experts in this field out from Australia. And they have created this beautiful anatomical um, uh, picture that, that very clearly shows the various muscles that live within the pelvic cavity. So we've got the bladder here and around the bladder, there's this black structure that extends all the way through the gray structure, which many of you are aware is the prostate. And that, that black part is essentially what we call smooth muscle. Now, smooth muscle is under the control of the brain. That means you don't have any control over it. It contracts for you when needed and you don't have to think about it. However, when you lose the prostate, you now become much more reliant and in fact, almost 100% reliant on the striated muscles. And these are the muscles in red here. So you've got this big muscle called the puborectalis muscle that goes from the rectum to the pubic bone. And then you've got that external urethral sphincter muscle, which I showed you as the middle layer of the pelvic floor muscles that squeezes around the urethra. And then you've got the bulbocavernosis muscle, which is that muscle of sexual function. And as I said earlier, the two muscles that are of primary importance for continence mechanisms is exactly the muscle that's under this blue arrow and the muscle that's under this green arrow. And the reason why they're so helpful to be working together is because if you're trying to stop water from coming out of a hose, you wouldn't just squeeze the hose like this. You would actually take the hose and fold it in half, and that would be more effective at preventing water from coming out. Well, the same thing holds true in this situation. When you want to prevent urine from escaping, you're gonna to wanna to squeeze down at the greatest curvature. And that's essentially where those two muscles are located. So technique really does matter and knowing how to isolate these muscles is extremely important. With the advent of transperineal ultrasound imaging, we actually can see how each of these muscles function uh, pre and then post prostatectomy. And we've come to see that the anatomy changes quite drastically after you've had your prostate removed. In fact, the bladder relocates almost behind a muscle, uh, the, the big puborectalis muscle that um, previously was helpful in our continence mechanisms. But now if it's used, it could actually potentially be closing down or squeezing down on the bladder, causing leakage. And so this is why technique really matters. And many of you are probably very aware of the Kegel exercise. And in fact, that exercise was created in 1940 by Dr. Arnold Kegel, hence the name. And unfortunately, that Kegel exercise has been kind of passed along to be the, the be all and end all. And that's just how pelvic floor exercises are to be done. But like I said, in this patient population, if you adopt techniques that were designed for women, 
um, who haven't had this type of surgery, then you actually might be making your situation worse. And so today we're going to explain very and of your oblique muscles, you know, they're, they're far more powerful than anything that you would be able to generate down below. So if you train and with the, those, um, or if you use the, the, the technique with your core muscles, then what could actually happen is you're going to create too much pressure and you're going to override their function or their ability to stay closed. Now, there are a number of reasons why post prostatectomy incontinence happens. And we talked about one is removing that internal sphincter, which is the prostate. It's a large muscular gland that did most of the work. When the bladder filled, the prostate gland would contract and that would prevent the bladder from emptying. And then if it was really, really urgent, you would call upon those backup muscles. And most of you have never used those backup muscles until perhaps you were in a situation where it was extremely urgent and you couldn't even get to a forest and so you had to use them. But those are far and few between and as such, those muscles tend to be quite weak. Now, you can also have damage to those very muscles. And if you look at this image here, you can see that that uh, external urethral sphincter muscle, the one that wraps around the urethra, gets reattached to the bladder neck. And that's what you see here through a su suturing process. And so in suturing those two pieces together, you can imagine that that muscle get, might get a little irritated and not function as well as it could in, in, the, in the earlier stages after surgery. Now, there's also this increased demand on these striated muscles, right, on the external urethral sphincter muscle because you haven't been using them and now they don't have their major worker there for them anymore. So they really have to get strengthened sufficiently so, so that they can take over the role of the primary worker, which was the prostate. Of course, damage to the neurovascular bundle that surrounds the prostate can, of course, affect the overall functioning uh, of your uh, continence mechanisms, but also of your erectile function. And that's why these uh, nerve bundles are preserved to the best of the surgeon's ability in an effort to allow for preservation uh, and or restoration of erectile function sometime after surgery. And also cutting away of the um, uh, supporting ligaments that held the prostate where it needs to be, as well as the bladder, creates an environment where these structures, uh, well, no longer the prostate, but the bladder now tends to move around a little bit more freely without the stability that it was once provided. And that creates um, irritation for the bladder. And when the bladder is kind of moving around in an unfavorable way, it tends to contract a little bit more often. And that could also be a reason for why one might experience incontinence. Now the same um, thing happens to men after radiation exposure. And the reason, however, here is different. And, and many of you have probably heard of, as, of radiation as the gift that keeps on giving because the changes that occur, um, they keep accruing over time. And this is uh, a, a condition known as radiation fibrosis. So they, they say that this is probably the main reason for why incontinence happens and possibly why erectile dysfunction also appears over time. But most of the men who've undergone radiation therapy won't necessarily experience incontinence right away. It usually can be up to a year, maybe longer, and maybe in some cases, not at all. But that's typically when you would start to experience the effects of radiation fibrosis. And that really just means that all the tissues in the area undergo this general kind of stiffening. They just don't have the elasticity that they once had. And um, that really starts to affect everything from the muscles, the urethra, the blood vessels, the bladder itself. Uh, and of course, all the surrounding tissues. Well, the images here that you see on the screen are little strictures. So that's the opening of the urethra. And when exposed to radiation, that urethra can start to close down on itself. And that create, that's essentially a medical emergency. And, and essentially what happens is the bladder stays relatively full and you kind of get this perpetual leak of urine um, with this fullness sensation. And so if that happens to be you, then you probably want to go and seek medical attention immediately. 
Now, despite all of this, there has been some very compelling research to date that shows very clearly that exercise uh, is a great solution to preventing the fibrosis from occurring and uh, certainly from impacting the function of the pelvic floor muscles. Uh, and the other key thing is that it also manages inflammation. And that's also true for both populations is when you exercise, if you've had your prostate removed, you're gonna have a significant amount of inflammation from the removal of that uh, structure in and of itself, but then also uh, following radiation that also happens. And so exercise has been shown to manage inflammation and in the presence of inflammation, you're putting a lot of pressure and increased sensitivity in all the structures that are in that environment. So getting rid of inflammation as quickly as possible is key. And exercise has been shown to be one of the most effective ways to do that. Now, after um, prostatectomy, some men still have to undergo radiation just because it hasn't been completely removed. Uh, and this often can result in more severe incontinence because the surrounding tissues become the target. So previously, if you did the radiation pre or without having your prostate removed, then the target is exactly the prostate and they try to be as uh, precise as they can be. However, in this situation, they have to extend beyond the margins and that's where um, the surrounding areas receive high doses of radiation. And that includes the rectum, the bulbar urethra and the bladder neck. And as you can imagine, radiation to these uh, structures can result in less than favorable outcomes. Now, the types of incontinence that happen post-prostatectomy, there's four of them. One of them is uh, a little bit more shocking, perhaps, to some. So we'll talk about that in a second. But the most important one, or the most common one, I should say, is the stress incontinence. And that's basically when you laugh, cough, sneeze, you lift a heavy object, get out of a car, those types of things. Anything that involves an increase in pressure acting on the pelvic floor muscles, that's when you'll lose some uh, urine. And pelvic floor muscle training is very effective at stopping this type of incontinence. Urge incontinence, or also known as overactive bladder, um, incontinence is a situation where you have this urge to urinate and it's it's very strong so you just don't have the strength or the ability to override it and then you lose uh, some urine as a result of that. Now there are certainly some lifestyle modifications which we'll touch on at the end of today's presentation that you can adopt to help reduce the appearance of this type of incontinence. There's certainly some medications that you can talk to your, to your doctor about that uh, however, with every medication, there are always uh, some side effects that you want to keep uh, in mind or at least discuss with your doctor so that you're certain that uh, the risks are worth it. Uh, but certainly also pelvic floor muscle training and something called a passive clamp protocol can be helpful in these circumstances as well. The overflow incontinence, we just talked about that with the strictures or any kind of scar, scar tissue formation that could also happen in the absence of radiation therapy. So uh, getting a catheter in and out sometimes can also result in that. So just be mindful if you have a situation where you have this constant leak of urine and you have this sense of fullness, that is a medical emergency and that's overflow incontinence. So the fourth type is the type that many men are surprised uh, to experience when it happens. And this happens um, when a man is aroused or is having an orgasm. And yes, after prostate cancer surgery, uh, particularly a prostatectomy, you can still have an orgasm. Orgasms and erections are completely separate nervous responses. And um, so you can still uh, achieve an orgasm in the absence of having that erection. It requires the same type of stimulation to uh, achieve the effect. Now, when you are aroused or have an orgasm, sometimes what you'll get is this involuntary loss of urine, and it can occur in up to 30% of men. So, oh, okay. uh, so what is suggested is that pelvic floor muscle exercises can help to inhibit the uh, reflex that occurs during an orgasm. And before the surgical procedure took place, you would have a reflexive relaxation of that external urethral sphincter to allow for the sperm to travel through and out the penis. But in this situation, the plumbing's been cut after, prostate, after a prostatectomy, and so there will no longer be any sperm leaving the system, which means you could in fact just train yourself to override that reflex and keep that sphincter closed during the experience of having an orgasm. 
There are various ways that you can try and practice this on your own before attempting it in a partner situation, for example. There's a vibration tool that a lot of men uh, tend to uh, enjoy, and it's called the Manta, and the image here is up on screen, and it just helps you achieve the uh, sensation of having an orgasm faster, as far as the men have been telling me, and it can also help you train yourself to hold on to that contraction so that you don't lose urine. I also recommend you try doing this in the washroom, especially, or in, sorry, in the, uh, in the shower, if it is your first time. There are other treatment options here that you can try is uh, certainly by emptying the bladder prior to having sex, wearing condoms to catch the urine, and then using a um, penile variable tension loop, which is what you see in this bottom image here. Now, if you happen to be training to try and inhibit this reflex and you're doing it often, uh, or you're maybe doing a lot of pelvic floor muscle training and you start to experience pain, this might be a result of overactivity of the pelvic floor muscles. And so you may want to talk to a healthcare provider, particularly a physiotherapist, as they will probably know more in terms of how to help you with this. Uh, but this is where down training would be more effective and making sure that you're giving the pelvic floor muscles an opportunity to relax. Because oftentimes we think just tighten, 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 and never let go. But that could result in scenarios where you might experience pain down under and less effective muscles. Okay, so sexual health, the topic that everybody wants to know about, but nobody wants to talk about. So we're going to talk about it today. After prostate cancer treatments, this type of um, or sexual health changes drastically and it can change for an extended period of time. But in order to understand why it changes, we need to understand what normal function is first. And so having an erection is a complex process that involves the interaction of a number of systems within the body. So including the nervous system, the hormonal system and the vascular system. And it requires normal functioning of the nerves that supply the various structures that reside inside and outside of the pelvis. What they know very clearly is that exercising the pelvic floor muscles has been shown to increase the uh, production of something called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide lives within your vessels. And when you contract the pelvic floor, they start to shear the inside of the vessels. And that releases the molecule nitric oxide, which is responsible for dilating the vessels. And that's extremely important for overall penile health and function. Now, in the top image, you can see a flaccid penis. And on top of the flaccid penis, you can see the dorsal vein. The dorsal vein in this case is open. But on the other side, you can see a penis that is engorging with blood. And what happens when that occurs is the dorsal vein starts to compress. Okay, so that's essentially, that's very important because that's what prevents the blood that's entered into the shaft of the penis to escape. In the post-prostatectomy population, this is called a venous leak. And that is the one of the contributing causes for why a man can no longer maintain their erection is because the blood comes in and it very quickly comes out because there's just not enough pressure being generated to compress on that nerve. So any disruption to the nerves have the potential to impair the function of the erection. And as I mentioned earlier, you saw this picture in a previous slide, they try to very carefully, certainly more so now with the robotic procedures, they try to very carefully remove the prostate without disrupting that neurovascular bundle. And they try to, it's called nerve sparing, and they try to spare both sides. Uh, however, on, in some certain cases, it's not possible because of the location of the cancer, but uh, they do try to spare those bundles as best as possible. However, if you look at this image here, the, the nerves that were housed around that prostate, they're basically now homeless, if you will, and it's going to take some time for them to find a new home, and they're going to have to reattach themselves to the bladder because that's what's going to typically reconnect um, itself to the urethra. And, um, and, and so that's going to take a very long time. In fact, it can take anywhere from two to four years uh, before that starts to reestablish itself. It's a condition actually called neuropraxia, and it's the temporary loss of nerve function without any structural damage to the nerve itself. And so these nerves are simply exposed to traction because things are being pulled away and to heat because there's a lot of cauterizing that goes on in an effort to remove these, uh, or to remove the prostate. And it results in a vascular supply shutdown, causing the loss of 1,500 nocturnal erections. The nocturnal erections are essentially housekeeping erections. They're, men will get anywhere from six to eight per night. And um, they, they have six to eight 
nocturnal erections or housekeeping erections a night, not for sexual purposes, but simply because they are designed to preserve the pressure in the, ere in the um, erectile tissue. And it's important to make sure that the pressure is over 35 millimeters of mercury pressure. Otherwise, what happens is that you get a deposition of scar tissue into the penile uh, structures. That can lead to fibrosis, and it then also leads to penile shortening. So not only do you get the venous leak, but you start getting the fibrosis and then the penile shortening, which unfortunately um, can compromise a man's ability to have full restoration of his erection after the two to four year period where the nerves have effectively healed. And that loss of penile length, initially, many of you may have uh, seen that there's about three to five centimeters from your shaft length that has kind of just disappeared immediately after surgery. And that's because the prostate is about that size, depending on how large yours was. And when that gets removed, they have to reattach two structures. So it pulls on the shaft and that's why there's an initial loss. But that's not the loss we're talking about here. The loss we're talking about is because of that fibrosis of that scar tissue that starts to deposit itself because the penis doesn't undergo that good and healthy stretch that it needs. Um, and now all of a sudden, whenever there's scar tissue in any structure in the body, it doesn't matter where it is, scar tissue always has the propensity of shrink wrapping everything in and pulling everything in towards it. It's not a flexible tissue and over time it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. So it's very important to start early penile rehab to prevent the appearance of fibrosis or, or scar tissue in the penis. Now, another condition that many men are surprised to find sometimes, not many, but one in six men after prostatectomy and then one in eight after radiation, uh, is this kind of curvature in their penis. And again, it's the fibrous plaques that develop, but unfortunately what happens is that the, cur the penis starts to curve because it's, it's just so concentrated in one space. And then that can create a painful situation where it could prevent future um, penetration. So what is penile rehab then? If we need to start it early, and by early, I mean one to two months post-operatively, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, and for men who've had radiation uh, surgery, that's a little bit different. That's about a year um, after they've had exposure. Again, because the changes happen over time. They're not so immediate. So the various lines of treatment are the ones that you can see here on the screen. The first line treatments are those that you're going to talk to your doctor about. And they're not always effective, but um, the Cialis is one that we've been instructed to recommend to our patients, uh, certainly to speak to their doctors about starting this. And it's a low dose Cialis at five milligrams that has been shown to help preserve the filling phase of the penis, which is just sufficient to keep it above that mercury of pressure required to prevent any kind of scar tissue deposition. And it also has been shown to help with continence control. So that's kind of nice. Um, the second line treatment options would be the vacuum erection devices. And I'm always curious how many people in the room have used vacuum erection devices. I'm just going to See maybe by a show of hands. If you don't feel comfortable, that's okay too. No problem. Um, but I uh, do highly recommend this option. And you can see the two types of erection devices here on the screen. I used to use this one called the Vacurect, and it's a manual pump. It's okay. It's just as I learn more about um, the requirements of a pump, I have transferred to or have changed to using the Androvac, which is the automatic pump you can see here. And this one is nice just because it's uh, easier to use. You don't have to manually do anything. You just push a button and the penis inserts into the pump. And through negative pressure, it just draws in the penis, creating an erection. And the various, uh, there's there's the, the, the gray ring you see on the inside is the training ring. And then there's also some sex rings that go onto the canister, onto the tube. And then when you're looking to hold on to the erection that you've created, you just drop that sex ring onto the base of the penis, and then it can be used for uh, your pleasure. Now, this is um, an important thing because what I find is men try to go and buy the uh, the erection devices that are out on the market, and then they use the instructions that are provided within. And of course, those instructions are not designed for men who've had their prostates removed. So I would highly recommend that if you're going this avenue, please seek out my help, or if there's another men's health specialist in the area, seek out their help who can give you the proper instructions on how to use these devices uh, for post-prostatectomy men. 
pelvic floor muscle training, as we already talked about in great detail, uh, is of course effective in helping not only improve the availability of nitric oxide, but also um, the uh, strength of your erectile function. And then the intracavernosal injections, men are a little bit queasy when it comes to this one. Uh, however, it is highly effective. It's recommended to use twice a week because it does give you an immediate erection within about 10 minutes of injection. Men say it feels somewhere between a mosquito bite and a bee sting for about a split second. And it's just a simple injection that goes into the flaccid penis. And within, like I said, 10 minutes, you have um, an erection that's suitable for penetration. Mm -hmm. What I do recommend, though, is if you are going to use this option, be um, be modest with how much you're injecting. Don't try to over-inject because if you over-inject, you might end up with a priapism, which is an erection that lasts for longer than four hours, and it's quite painful. I've seen some patients with it, uh, and they end up in the hospital, uh, despite my recommendations, uh, getting more <laughs> needles to drain the, the penis, and uh, that it, the whole experience is just not pleasant. So what I say is, be modest with how much you're injecting and then use your pump to get the rest through that capacity. And then you can just prevent any kind of medical emergencies altogether. And then the third line treatment options are obviously the most invasive. These are the penile prosthetic implants. They've got great satisfaction rates, but of course, very invasive. And so we would want to exhaust our um, conservative measures before uh, entertaining this option. So, the role of pelvic floor muscle training, of course, is, imp is important preoperatively as we know that it can significantly improve the time to achieve continence. Postoperative pelvic floor muscle training is just as important if you haven't uh, been introduced to pelvic floor muscle training before your surgery. And it has been shown to reduce the expected one year to recovery by as much as six to nine months. So that's really exciting. And then pelvic floor muscle training is also helpful in preventing the occurrence of fibrosis following radiation therapy, and it can help with the restoration of erectile function. When I teach my men how to contract their pelvic floor muscles, I call it Kegels uh, instead of the former Kegel, because as I mentioned, a Kegel is very different than what I teach my men. And so we call it a Hegel and Hegeling pre and post surgery is essential to one's recovery. These are some research um, uh, evidence or research or, or evidence journals that indicate um, the, the effectiveness of preoperative pelvic floor muscle training on incontinence problems after radical prostatectomy. And it's a meta-analysis, which is our highest level of medical evidence. Um, we also have a systematic review, again, highest level of medical evidence that supervised comprehensive functional physiotherapy after radical prostatectomy is more effective than pelvic floor muscle training alone. And that just basically means a global training program. And if you have ever worked with me or are going to in the future, you will come to see that I am a huge proponent of exercise. Uh, I live and breathe exercise and I have come to uh, see the benefits that it can offer. I've witnessed it in my men. Those who engage in these global training programs do far better than those who just focus on their pelvic floor muscles alone. And despite the fact that this evidence indicates post-operative, as I mentioned, my focus in my research is looking at the pre-operative benefits, and I uh, am, am compelled to believe that engaging in pre-operative training will be far more beneficial than while doing it after surgery. And then this is, again, another high-level evidence systematic review of pelvic floor muscle training for erectile dysfunction, and again, it just supports the efficacy of training your pelvic floor muscles to restore erectile function thereafter. Okay, so the moment we've all been waiting for. This is the moment where hopefully everyone's going to actively participate. If you don't want anybody watching you, you can turn your screens off, but I do recommend that you try to follow along because this is ultimately what you need to be doing to prevent any kind of incontinence from uh, occurring in your lives. So there are two types of muscle fibers that live within the pelvic floor. You've got fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles. And if you want to think about it like a sprinter and a marathon runner, okay? So a sprinter is fast and powerful. A marathon runner can run at a consistent speed for a very long time. And so it's important that we train both of these because when you cough or lift, those would be moments where, and also sexual function, those would be moments where your power muscles come into play. Whereas if you're going for a walk, for example, or a run or just being active for an extended period of time, that would involve your endurance muscles. 
And so when you're training your power muscles, you need to train them rapidly at a rate of one per second. So you contract and relax very quickly. And you do that 10 times for three sets. So let's talk about how and how we find the pelvic floor muscles, okay? So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to have a look. I don't know how many people are gonna participate, but I'm just gonna change my view. And what I'm gonna propose everyone tries to do with me, and hopefully I'll get some active participation here, is if you're sitting on a rolling chair like I am, make sure that it's against the surface or, or something that's gonna stop it from rolling. You're gonna move yourselves way forward on your seats. And what you're essentially trying to find are your two sit bones here, okay? So you're sitting on your bum and you should feel your sit bones. You should, if you're moving forward and back, kind of sitting up tall and then slouching, you're gonna start to feel the front and back of those sit bones. Please try and find those. If you can find those, then what you want to do is you want to make sure you lean forward. If you have a desk, that this is a great way for you to assume this exercise. If not, you can just post your hands on your leg or you can go down to your forearm. So one thing you've got to watch, though, is that it doesn't look like this. And unfortunately, not everybody has tremendous flexibility because it's not something we work on. So you may find it easier to keep that spine straight if you're using a desk in front of you. Okay, now the cue that we give is thinking about drawing your penis in towards your body, trying to move your penis without your hands, of course, and or trying to stop the flow of urine, whichever cue works best for you. But that's what you've got to start thinking about is that you're trying to physically move your penis, stop the urine from coming out, and you're trying to sense, do I feel something happening? in this space between my two sit bones. Can I feel a tightening happening down below when I squeeze and then let go? When I squeeze and when I let go. Mm -hmm. do, do we feel anything happening there? Can yeah. I get some thumbs up if you guys feel something happening? Thank you, yeah. Andre. I've got one person listening to me. Yes. 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 Okay, we got some more people. Excellent, great. So, um, so if you can sense that feeling, those are essentially your pelvic floor muscles squeezing and letting go, squeezing and letting go. And so when you're sitting, you have support from the chair. So it makes it a little bit easier. And so I encourage everybody who's never done this to, to start this way, but this is not the way the research tells us to keep going, okay? And in a second, we'll try it in standing, but you'll see many of you may all of a sudden be like, oh, I can't feel it anymore, which is fine. It just means you have to start here. So in this position, like I said, we're going to do three sets of 10 where we're going to squeeze and then let go, squeeze and then let go. Okay. Now, remember, we don't want to use the muscles from here. So we don't want to brace like this. You're just trying to stay very relaxed. You should be able to have a conversation with somebody because I'm doing it right now while I'm talking to you guys. I'm squeezing and I'm letting go. And that is the ultimate goal. Can you have a conversation with somebody while you're doing your pelvic floor contractions? Many of you have to focus when you're starting. And that's fine. Right. You very quickly have to be able to huh? discuss. Okay. The question is if somebody forgot to mute. I'll mute them. Hold on a Thank second. You. So, hopefully you've had an opportunity to try 10 in a row. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to ask everybody just to slouch. Just, just go back to maybe where you were sitting before. Really yeah. bad posture. This is where everybody should turn off their videos. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, just imagine you're trying to squeeze now. Just do it now for fun. And just feel, like really become aware, where do I feel that contraction, okay, stop, relative to the proper technique, this contraction. Try it this way. Now, hopefully what you felt was one was coming in the back end and the other one was happening more in the front end. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned to you earlier, 
we're really trying to make sure that we isolate the muscles in the front triangle for the mat. We do not want to be going after the back triangle. So this is where I emphasize technique is important. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, perfect. So that's the sitting position. Now the same thing would hold true if we were practicing in um, if we were practicing and trying to engage the pelvic floor muscles as endurance muscles. So nothing changes. We're all just going to sit in that perfect posture and we're going to contract the pelvic floor muscles and hold for 10 seconds. <clears throat> now, how many of you can maintain a conversation while you're holding for 10 seconds? Not very easily. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot harder, but this is the goal is you have to be able to communicate because that's normal life. If you can't do two things at once, this is where you're going to lose control because you're going to talk and then you're going to forget. You're like, oh, so when you're training, you have to train appropriately. You have to train for the circumstances that are going to present themselves to when you. I talk when I'm doing this. I'm holding it. I'm trying to have a conversation. <laughs> I, I don't know who is just speaking, but I, I think somebody was saying they're trying to hold it and have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so holding it for 10 seconds, same idea, right? It's just, it's not going to be at 100% power because you're not, you can't do anything at 100% at power for longer than three-ish seconds, right? So if you're holding this for 10 seconds, you're going to reduce your intensity, how strong you're holding that contraction, maybe to about 60, 70%, depending on how good you are. Sometimes it might go down to 50, 40. It all depends on what you're able to do. You've got to kind of play with that and get better over time. And so you hold it and you hold it for 10 seconds, breathing normally, having a conversation. And then when you're done, you can let it go. Now, there's a third type of exercise called the elevator. And the elevator focuses very much on the lengthening of the muscle. So if you're familiar with the muscle contraction, when the muscle shortens, that's one contraction. But when the muscle lengthens, that's also another type of contraction. I'm going to ask you to mute. Thank you so much. And so, as I said, shortening is one type of contraction, and then lengthening is another type. And it's important to train the muscle in its lengthening phase just as much as it is in a shortening phase. That gives you better control of the muscle and also arguably stronger muscles, okay? So when we're thinking about how do we train the lengthening of the muscle, well, think about it like this, like a pyramid. Okay, so you start with a 0% contraction, so everything's relaxed, and then you squeeze by one quarter or 25%, then squeeze up to 50%, squeeze up to 75, then get to your 100% contraction, and then only let go to 75, only let go to 50, only let go to 25, and then full release. How hard was that? <laughs> not too hard that was a lot trickier okay but very necessary despite how challenging some of these are it, they are still very very important and the better control the better you have awareness of those different percentages of your contraction the better off you're going to be as you're going to have more control and more strength of these muscles okay so that's all set nice and done that we did that in sitting and as I said, it's a great starting point, but the research shows very clearly that when you do your pelvic floor muscle contractions in sitting versus standing, you will have a 42% recovery of your incontinence versus a 72% recovery is what the research showed. So of course, we want to do it in standing as quickly as possible. And so when we get up to standing, but before we get up, actually, here we go. Let me just see if anybody's been listening very carefully to what I've been saying about how important it is to incorporate your pelvic floor muscle contractions into activities of daily living, such as talking. Everybody just stand up for me. Okay, now I'm going to ask the question. As everybody went from sit to stand, how many people thought about contracting their pelvic floor as they went from sit to stand? I think some of you may have and others I'm seeing shaking of the head so that's a big important time to do this if you're not contracting your pelvic floor during a moment of transition which is a very typical time when men have leakage then you can bet your bottom dollar you're going to continue to leak if you're not closing the pipe 
it's going to come out. It's very simple. You have to think about contracting that pelvic floor to prevent any kind of leakage. So you've got to put these muscle exercises into play. It's not enough just to contract, 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 and not put that into the movements that are causing leakage. This is the biggest missing link in everything that I've ever done with men is that nobody tells them to put it into play. Okay, so please take that home and remember it. It's so important when you're getting out of your car, when you're going for a walk, when you're lifting groceries, when you're getting dressed, when you're getting in and out of a shower, whatever the case might be. Think about those moments where you have incontinence. What about when you cough? What about when you sneeze? You have to contract the pelvic floor and then cough while you're holding. Okay, you have to train your brain to incorporate the pelvic floor muscles into these activities so that eventually it becomes automatic. Because right now, the brain doesn't equate the pelvic floor muscle. It hasn't put the pelvic floor muscles into your activities of daily living because it never needed it before. It had something there before. So you have to retrain the brain to make it automatic. And you can do this just like you can learn anything. When you first started riding a bike, you were very unstable and you were scared and mom and dad couldn't let you go. And then all of a sudden you're riding the bike and you're talking on your phone or talking to your friends and you're not even thinking about riding the bike anymore. Why? Because you've done it so many times that it just becomes automatic and the brain encodes movement. Okay, so now when we're in standing, there's a position called the ski jump. And so the ski jump basically requires you to hinge forward almost like you're on the edge of a, of a mountain and you're about to go off and you're hinging forward notice very clearly that i'm not doing this I'm not face planting and i'm not hinging at my hips the hinge is actually happening at my ankle i know you can't see that but all that's happening is i'm shifting my body weight forward and you can put your hands behind you so you can count the bounce but what you feel like is that you need to take a step because you're almost going to fall forward and again, you go into this D jump position in an effort to isolate the front triangle. So let's do that again. Let's do 10 fast contractions at a rate of one per second at 100% power, not using the core muscles. And try to count out loud to make it easier to make sure that you're actually breathing instead of holding your breath. Ready? One, two, three, four, four five, five, six, six seven, seven, eight. eight. Nine, seven. Yeah. So now, just for fun, go into like a bad posture. Just kind of hang out and try it now. One, two, three, four. Can you feel how that just went into the bubble? Hopefully, you can feel the difference from being in your ski jump position versus in your bad posture. Okay, it's just a simple shift to the front of the foot versus the back. And then the same thing holds true here. Now, I mentioned that some of you might find it difficult to feel the pelvic floor in this muscle. Why? Because you don't have the support now. The chair is gone. So now all the pressure of gravity and all your internal organs and all the weight of your body is acting on the pelvic floor. So you've got to think about that, right? So sometimes you might need to stick to the sitting position until you build up that strength and then progress slowly from there, okay? And then let's just try one more time. We're gonna do the endurance one. All in the ski jump position, and we're gonna hold and squeeze for 10 seconds, 10, nine, eight, seven. Try and hold it six. If you feel like you're losing it, just tighten it back up, five, four. Make sure you're leaning forward, three, two, one, and then let it go. And let's just do one quick elevator here. So we're going to squeeze 25%, 50, 75, 100, 75, 50, 25, zero. And it's important to be able to feel each of those different stages to also make sure that you get your pelvic floor muscles to relax. Because as I mentioned earlier, if the pelvic floor muscles don't relax, that can also be a problem down the road. Because if you don't let a muscle relax, how well is it going to perform over time? Not very. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So we talked about the high intensity fast twitch. We talked about the slow twitch. We talked about building it into your walking regime. 
right? You've got to start putting these things into play to make sure that you're getting the most out of these muscles. And to finish us off, there were, uh, I mentioned earlier that there were some lifestyle modifications that one needs to make beyond just pelvic floor muscle training. And so this is where you would want to think about removing bladder irritants. And bladder irritants include things like coffee, tea, dark pops, chocolate, alcohol. Unfortunately, if you're going to drink, alcohol relaxes the striated muscles, the muscles that you are now 100% reliant on. And if you relax those muscles, I would say chances are you're going to lose control. So to avoid embarrassment in those situations, because I'm not proposing that you never have a drink again, but wear a pad, just be safe. You don't need to have any embarrassing moments. Cigarettes, of course, I don't need to talk about that. Spicy foods, milk, particularly milk from a cow, and then orange juice, uh, any kind of lemon, lime, citrus, grapefruit, those types of things. They are all bladder irritants and they will make the bladder contract and that will cause you to lose control because the bladder is a really strong muscle and it will always be stronger than your pelvic floor. We are designed brilliantly and beautifully and the pelvic floor cannot be stronger than the bladder. Otherwise, essentially we could kill ourselves by keeping the urine into the bladder and then that would reflect reflux up to the kidneys resulting in kidney damage and ultimately death. So we don't have that anatomical design, thank God. And so the bladder is strong enough to get rid of anything that is destructive to it. And if it is already in a sensitive state, because for example, maybe you're very recently pre or post-operative, then the bladder is already going to be quite sensitive. So anything additional you put into it, it's not going to react very well. You may want to wait to introduce these things later on down the road, or maybe you're already consuming a bunch of these things and you're finding that your incontinence is still an issue. These might be the one things that you want to see. Hey, what if I remove these things? Would it help? And then a lot of people end up um, stopping drinking. Like they just think, oh, okay, well, I'm leaking, so I'm not going to drink water anymore. Well, that's the worst thing you can do because concentrated urine arriving into the bladder is toxic. And that bladder is going to squeeze with all its might to get rid of anything that's damaging to it. And that's essentially what happens. So you'll actually make your incontinence worse if you do that. And then the other thing is that I find a lot of men feel like the, the, the uh, loss of urine and then they try to empty their bladder every time they feel leakage. But leakage doesn't mean that you have the urge to pee. Leakage is because you're not squeezing the pelvic floor muscles to keep it inside. So when you feel leakage, don't run to the bathroom. Use your muscles to stop it so that the bladder can actually fill in. And then you also want to work on urge suppression techniques. So if you do feel that your bladder is, is full, then don't answer to the first urge. We didn't need to answer to the first urge. That's just the bladder at 250 mils. The bladder has a far greater capacity than 250 mils. And it's just, a, it's just a quiet indication. It's just saying, hey, just so you know, you got some urine in the bladder. If you wanted to empty, you could, but we just wanted you to know. And that's the only signal you get from the first urge. It's not necessary. So I encourage my men to use that as a training opportunity, because if you can hold back against the urge of, or the first urge, then your pelvic floor muscles are going to get a little bit stronger because of that. It's like weight training on them. So we use it as an opportunity to get stronger, not as an opportunity to go and boy. Now, there are some people who don't necessarily feel an urge. And I, I have a, a specific protocol in place that I help them with uh, to, to develop that urge again and to stretch the bladder because sometimes the bladder um, was so overactive before because you may have had an enlarged prostate. And so the bladder just kind of kept emptying, emptying, emptying. And in those cases, we need to teach the bladder to stretch again. So that's something called the passive clamp protocol. And it's a six week protocol, which I can talk to you about one on one if you're interested in booking an appointment to learn more about that. Um, but it's also a nice tool if you happen to be somebody who's just leaking a great deal and it, it might buy you a couple hours if you're going out or something like that. And the top one's called the Pacey Cuff and the bottom one's called the Dribble Stop. You can order those online. And then, of course, um, you know, walking just in general is important for managing inflammation, for cardiovascular health, for pelvic floor muscle training. And those are important things that you want to make sure you're introducing into your daily routine. So the take home messages is that technique matters for healing, not kegeling. Intensity also matters. You do have to train to fatigue. So it has to be challenging. 
Uh, six sets per day is what the recommended uh, protocol states. And of course, in standing. So as soon as you feel confident, you transfer to standing positions as soon as possible. You also should not be having any leakage during these contractions. And if you are, that's uh, something you want to bring to my attention or somebody like myself to help you find a position that will help prevent any kind of incontinence. And then global conditioning and pelvic floor muscle training changes the neural control or the, the control from the nerves. Uh, it enhances the strength of the pelvic floor muscles as well as the blood flow, and it can prevent radiation fibrosis. Performing your pelvic floor muscle exercises six weeks post or pre-operatively, sorry, before surgery can significantly reduce the post-operative incontinence. And penile rehab should begin within one to two months following surgery or within a year after radiation therapy. Please don't hesitate to visit our YouTube channel or website. Uh, New Life Physiotherapy is the YouTube channel. Newlife.ca is our website. We have tons of pelvic floor exercises and workshops available for you on those uh, online platforms. And as I mentioned, we are hosting a free virtual session to help you learn how you can optimize the function of your pelvic floor beyond just pelvic floor muscle exercises on May 24th at 6 p.m. And uh, you can register for that at, uh, by emailing me. My receptionist will uh, compile a list and send out the Zoom link once we get that all sorted out. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. So I thank you so much for your attention. And I am happy to entertain any questions at this time. So thank you, Christina. That, that was quite amazing. <laughs> Including, I, I love the exercise part. Of it. <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to open it up to questions from both online and in person as well. So if you guys have any questions, just please unmute and ask your questions. Before you, um, can you pre, uh, preview back your social media, please? Yes, of course I can. Yeah. Is that okay there? Uh, just or a minute. Or did you okay, want? Okay, good enough. Yeah, that's good. Good for me. Do you want this one, this one, or this one? Well, both. I can take both of them. It's just that I want to go follow you on social media. That's so. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Questions from the audience, both here and online. Please, I am um, Earl. I have a question. Yeah. Um. Am I, am I, am I? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. We can um, hear you. Are, are you covered by OHIP or by um, health, other health insurance plans? So we are covered under private uh, insurance. Okay. Yep. I have a question. Um, so for me who have never had any um, surgery, no prostate, cancer, and as a fitness individual who been exercising for many years, uh, what would be some of those techniques that I can practice and also teach my clients around pelvic floor exercises? Um, some of the ones that I currently do is like breathing, up, uh, engage the abdominal, and also contracting the pelvic floor. Are those three good techniques to use? Yes, uh, I would encourage you, Andre, to come and, and meet with us on May 26th. You'll learn okay. a, the comprehensive training part on that okay. day. This okay. this is just strictly pelvic floor muscle training. Uh, but if you're actually training a lot of men uh, yeah. or, or women, uh, the, the exercises that we'll be showing there are, are all the exercises that were in the... Um, in the uh, systematic review that um, suggested that we in introduce everything from flexibility to balance, to strength, to core, to breathing, mindfulness, all those things. So we're going to touch a little bit on, on each of those. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. But yes, breathing is, is huge and how it's done is even more important. A lot of people don't focus on the, on the details of it, uh, but you'll, we'll, we'll definitely cover that one off for sure. Um, in, in the, uh, in the workshop, and then we'll touch on a few core exercises that are helpful. So I noticed that you didn't talk about weight training. I, I did not? Yeah, how does or weight weight training play into? Like lifting weights? Yes. 
So yeah, cool. how does it help? Yes. Huge. <laughs> so, um, so the pelvic floor muscles are um, muscles that stabilize. Can you see that image? Yeah. Yeah, so the pelvic floor muscles are designed to stabilize the pelvis, the spine, and the hips, right? But that's not their only role. As I, I alluded to at the very beginning, they've got five different functions. And if these muscles don't have the support from the external muscles to offload some of that work, then they're going to be taxed and they're not going to work nearly as well. So we know very clearly that having additional external support from the muscles that surround the pelvis is incredibly important. The core is also a big player in the pelvic floor function because we know that the core muscles, um, or actually, so the, the, the pelvic floor muscles don't work on their own. They work with a series of muscles that make up the inner core. And there's a massive muscle called the transverse abdominis, the diaphragm, and the multifidus along the back of the spine. And all four of those muscles work like gears on a bike. And if any one of those muscles aren't working appropriately, then the next one obviously isn't going to move very well either. So we have to think about how well the core is working. And then we also have to think about all the muscles that feed from the legs down. Posture is also important. There's some evidence to support the efficacy of posture and making sure that your back muscles are strong, that your chest muscles are also strong and flexible. Typically, a muscle that's not uh, strong isn't going to stretch well. So when people come to me and they, they're they very tight, I, I'm not really that person who's going to put them on a stretching program. I'm going to say, okay, let's get you on uh, a strengthening program so that the muscle can stretch. The brain's not silly. It's not going to say, oh, that muscle is weak. Let's stretch it. No, it's going to keep it short because if it stretches it any further, it's going to get even weaker. So you have to build up the strength of a muscle to allow for improved flexibility. And flexibility is another important component of optimizing the function of the pelvic floor. So, so weight training is, is absolutely imperative in this whole mix. And like I said, uh, I talked to you about how uh, the men that I have who follow the comprehensive program do significantly better than the men who simply follow just the pelvic floor muscle training. Hmm. Questions from the audience? I have yeah. another question. I have another yeah. question. Yeah. What about what about age? Does that have a fact? Does that play a factor in what can or cannot be done? As long as you're medically cleared to exercise, then you're good to go. Exercise is not going to harm anybody. In fact, it's only going to make you stronger and more agile. It's going to help the function of your pelvic floor. There, there really is, unless you have any medical reason for why you shouldn't exercise, there's really no reason why yeah. it wouldn't be of a benefit to you. Yeah, but at my age, my, my muscles are so limp now. I don't know if you can do anything for them. <laughs> as long as your heart is beating, my friend, anything is possible. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, you have to more so ask yourself, why are they that way? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Anyone else have a question? Christina, I was uh, wondering, in terms of general exercise, what type of a workout would best remedy? Um, I don't have any problems with uh, leakage or anything like that, but I've noticed that the quality of the erection is significantly, significantly diminished. Uh, yep. So I'm wondering, um, I noticed as well, I haven't worked out as much as I used to for maybe four or five months, but what particular type of workout regime would best remedy this? Yeah. So in the absence of any kind of cardiovascular disease, because if you're having a waning erection, um, we know that that is an early warning sign for a cardiovascular event within about three to five years. Okay, in the absence of having your prostate removed, but if there's been some more recent changes that weren't prevalent before, I would always first and foremost recommend that you get cleared by a cardiologist to make sure that there's no concerns there. Uh, but beyond that, cardiovascular exercise is op is extremely important because you're trying to enhance the blood flow uh, to to those tissues, and the stronger the heart is, obviously, the better it can perfuse the blood to those areas. And when you're dealing with smaller and smaller vessels, that heart has to be sufficiently strong to be able to pump through there. Um, the other thing is certainly weight training of any sort creates a process called angiogenesis, which is the production of new blood vessels. And so whether you're doing, um, you know, weight training or pelvic floor muscle training, the process of building muscle creates new blood vessels, which then allows for better perfusion of those tissues. And of course, uh, the neurological adaptation that comes with weight training is um, uh, very important as well, because once you get more nerves feeding into this space, you get better control and uh, response out of those tissues. 
So cardiovascular training, weight training, um, and and I would go as far as including flexibility uh, mm -hmm. once you, you've kind of uh, developed some strength. And then uh, balance training is actually incredibly important because the muscles of the pelvic floor are uh, stabilizing muscles uh, heavily involved in balance. And so that's another area where I find uh, older populations tend to struggle very, very badly with it. Um, but it's a really simple exercise that doesn't require a whole lot of effort for somebody who maybe uh, is more deconditioned. That typically is where I start them to kind of get two birds with one stone, uh, working not only on the balance, but as we're doing the balance, they're also developing some strength. Thank you. And dynamic Good. stretching is actually very useful while you're strengthening as well. So dynamic stretching, you can add some weights to that. For example, I can just show you like uh, one of the exercises uh, that kind of takes everything in one. So basically you would just be, uh, you'd have weight and you'd kind of do a single leg deadlift and you have weight in your hands, right? And as you're working on your balance, you're then stretching your hamstring and then you're coming back up. So it's, it's like a triple um, exercise where you're not only, um, you know, developing your strength, but you're getting your flexibility and your balance as well. And so there's a number of exercises that kind of reflect something like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And of okay. course, when you're doing these things, sorry, I can just go off on tangents. <laughs> uh, when you're doing these things, um, it's also important to think about engaging your pelvic floor, right? So when you're learning something like what I just demonstrated, you're not going to be able to think about your pelvic floor in the moment. But mm. once it becomes easy, then you start bringing your pelvic floor into those experiences or into that ex exercise, right? And you think, okay, if I'm going to do 10 reps, can I hold the pelvic floor while I'm going up and down 10 times? I call it the golf ball pickup, right? And so, um, so yeah, so that's kind of uh, something you have to think about too, is, is once you get these exercises, can you actually introduce the pelvic floor contraction into those exercises as well? Okay, is Earl coming at you again? All right, Earl, um, you're up. Uh, um, I, 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 people know me to be a questionable person, so that's why I ask that's all okay. these questions. Um, for, <clears throat> excuse me. For persons who have dementia and maybe suffer from incontinence, do you think there's any, do you work for those types of patients as well? Uh, unfortunately, I do not see those types of patients in my clinic. Uh, those types of patients are usually medically cared for or in some kind of long-term care facility um, where they're typically in diapers because they can't, they don't have the capacities right. to think about doing this and training these muscles. Um, what we have done for neurological conditions, however, is using that Amcella chair um, or, or dementia is using that um, high intensity focused electrical magnetic stimulation device where you sit on the chair fully closed and, and it delivers super maximal pelvic floor muscle contractions to your pelvic floor um, uh, over a period of 28 minutes and you do it over three weeks, twice a week, so six sessions. And, uh, it basically supercharges your pelvic floor muscles. So those people, uh, would potentially benefit from that. Again, the research is quite scarce, uh, and mm -hmm. limited at this moment, but that would be kind of an option to better manage the incontinence for that patient population. But again, that is, um, not free and it's not a cheap, uh, option either. So. They usually, unfortunately, end up in diapers, which is sad, but when you can't think about strengthening anymore, it's hard to force anybody to do it, right? Hmm. One, one question. Um, you, you indicated that uh, we should reduce the amount of spice, spicy foods. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, yeah. Sorry, we, we, we use a lot of spicy because... Um, we have diabetes in our family. Yeah. And so I we don't use, I should just a minimum amount of salt. So we use a lot of spices. What do you say about that one? Yeah. So again, it's a trial and error thing, Eugene. Um, you're, you know, it's not to say that all those bladder irritants are going to affect every person the same way. That's not, that's not mm. what I'm saying. It's just a matter of testing it out. Right. So you kind of say, okay, you know what? Uh, I have incontinence and I wonder if these bladder irritants are affecting it. So oh. I'm going to run a test. I'm going to remove these bladder irritants for 
you know, a period of a week or so, maybe two weeks typically. And then you kind of test and see, okay, did that make a difference? Was there any change? And if it was, then okay, great. Then you can start reintroducing um, perhaps your most favorite one. So in your case, you would reintroduce spicy food and you would see, did that change anything? If it did, well, you know that it's probably irritating your bladder. If it didn't, then you can keep adding the other ones in until you find the culprit. Does that make sense? But, okay. Yeah, okay. So, sounds good. Yeah. Christina, um, this information that you're providing was never provided for me. Right. It was <clears throat> sort of go home and go figure out Kegel exercises and, you know, get it going. Has this improved over the years in terms of information given by the surgeons? Hmm. And herein lies the million dollar question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is that Ken? Is that Ken that yeah. asked me that question? Yeah. So Ken, that's exactly, actually, I was just doing a, a questionnaire that I'm going to be delivering to physicians and urologists across Ontario um, so that I can kind of get a better understanding of the current healthcare practices that are being employed, uh, mm -hmm. partic particularly in this patient population, because it is my understanding that this information is not being conveyed. Uh, and it is now my job to determine how we're going to get this information out there. And it's actually something called implementation science. So it's knowledge translation. And how do we get the evidence into practice? <clears throat> um, and it really actually, funny enough, you mentioned it comes from you guys. And that is probably one of the best strategies is that the patients have to keep asking for it. Right. And that's one of the questions on my on my questionnaire is, are the patients asking for it? And hence why when individuals and organizations like yourselves ask me to put something like this together so I can share this information. My hope in return is that all of you now spread this word and tell whomever it is that, you know, tell your doctors. I saw this presentation, why isn't this information out there? I saw this presentation and ask for it and ask for it and just keep because it's the patients. If you guys develop the need for it then at some point there's going to have to be a response yeah right you and to, so if you, it's, if you wanted to take part in any you know questionnaire we'd be happy to send it out to the guys to, yes please. yeah so absolutely and, and i mean at some point um i i may be reaching out to the walnut foundation uh, just just to to help with some of the research that i'm going to be doing on that preoperative um <clears throat> approach so if there are people who are willing to participate in research then um you know i'll be reaching out to ken or to winston to to you know yeah. send out the consent form and and you guys can let me know whether or not you're on board sure. but, but um, it is but, definitely a big work uh i've got a lot of work ahead of me to try and make a difference because i i, I know i hear it every day uh, men are very, very frustrated that this information is not available. And, yeah. and the sad thing is that there's not many pelvic floor physiotherapists that have gone into the world of men's pelvic health. Most of us stay in, in the female uh, area uh, for whatever reason. But I have to vote for it because that helped me. Mm -hmm. I went. Yeah. It helped me. It's it's huge. It makes such a, it's a, it makes a world of difference. And I mean, the, today we just touched on the surface, right? The, the, the amount of detail that I go in with my patients and the bladder logs and the pad tests, and I've designed a test called the functional incontinence measure. And so my men go through this measure and we, and, and it's basically an exercise, uh, six exercises that have known to cause or that, that are known to cause uh, incontinence and we put them through this measure we basically weigh the pad pre-op they have to drink 500 mils before they get there they we weigh the pad we put them through these six exercises and then we pay, weigh the pad afterwards we decide okay we determine how much wetness there is and then they're sent home to do this protocol every time and they've got to beat their previous pad test so now eventually what happens is it starts to develop this automaticity in them. And then when they get back and see us six weeks later, we do it again and we measure. And most of the time I have yet to, I've been men who have uncontrolled diabetes. That's a very tricky one. When you have uncontrolled diabetes and, and prostate cancer, or uh, you've had a prostatectomy, if it's not controlled, it, you're, I'm not going to lie. It's not going to be pretty. And it's, it's the, the incontinence is going to be pretty severe. Um, you've got to control that sugar if you're diabetic. I'll say that now. Because it's not, you're, you're not helping yourself. 
if those sugar levels are not well managed, that bladder is going to get very irritated very quickly. So keep that in mind. Anyhow, there, but yeah. There, there's a question here in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Christina, so the yes. part of the problem here be that men don't complain or they don't express that there's a problem to their practitioners, so they think, oh, they're okay. You know. Yeah, say that one more time. Sorry. Um could it be an issue that men don't um, convey to their medical practitioner yeah. that yeah. they're having this problem of incontinence or ED or whatever it means, post surgery. So they don't right. really a problem. Right. So that's another thing in the research, right? So that's part of my survey too, is do do patients talk to you, not you, but like, do patients talk to urologists about the problem? And then do you talk to the patient about the problem? Because it's also that exactly that point of communication is, is there even a discussion being had? Because the doctor might just assume you're here, everything's good, nobody's asking questions, and then they move on, right? But there has to be that discussion. And, and there is some evidence to, to show that no, that discussion is not being had, and and the the discussion of incontinence uh, is 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 not being addressed, or or the the condition of incontinence is not being addressed because it's not being talked about, and they're not being referred where they need to be referred. Uh, fortunately for myself, I have Dr. Shagan, whom I don't know how many people here have heard of Dr. Bobby Shagan, maybe a few, but um, he's uh, you know a world-renowned surgeon doing these robotic procedures and he has graciously accepted me um, or accepted to be a part of my committee for my PhD so I'm really hoping with him on my side that we can make some pretty significant strides in terms of how we're changing healthcare for for men afflicted with this condition so I I, I see a lot of promise in what we're doing um, and uh, I think I have a really really powerful team that's going to help me uh achieve the goals that I'm hoping to achieve for all of you. But uh, Christina, in your in your um, project, I'll, I'll, are you also trying to get OHIP on board? That was actually something that was discussed at a seminar that I was just at yesterday. Um, that would be a whole nother endeavor at this point. Uh, <laughs> And, and maybe down the pipeline somewhere when I'm doing some independent mm -hmm. research. Um, it is in my questionnaire um, in terms of why right. are you not referring your patients to physio and is it because it's too costly, right? right. So right. There, there will be some data that I'm collecting on that. And if I see that that's one of the big driving factors, then maybe that might motivate me to look into that a little bit further because I know it is costly. The other thing that we're looking at uh, perhaps developing is online, evidence-based online information resources that are not Google-based um you know or dr google uh because they're not accurate and so if we can somehow uh develop better information or accessibility to credible information then that might be another way to help with the uh inequalities with regards to who receives health care and who doesn't or private health care i should say okay are there any other questions from the audience, please unmute and ask, or the guys in the room here can ask questions as well. Um, I, if you can just share your um, vi uh, YouTube uh, channel again. Yeah, is it not? I'm still sharing, aren't I? Yeah, but I yeah. don't see the YouTube. The next one, one. The next slide. Over. Oh, okay. It's New Life Physiotherapy is the channel, but um, let me just, is that better there? I mean, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's all. I've been I've been searching for you for on Instagram for the longest while and I can't find you. New life physio on Instagram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you're probably gonna find me under my name. Um, I'm not gonna lie, guys. Not a big social media person. I don't have time to get on social media. I am so mm. busy. Um, I think my I think it's my name. Uh, let me but just double on, check. She's on YouTube though. It's Christina.newlife. Sorry, it's okay. Christina.newlife and new life is with a K. And the reason new life is with a K is because I like to 
provide people with the knowledge they need to achieve their new life. So that's okay. why it's felt like a. So because I couldn't but find you on social media, I did send you an email. You will see an email coming from me. I did send it already because I'm interested okay. in the class, in the webinar. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Well, then my receptionist will get that and we'll uh, send out that Zoom link as soon as uh, okay, as soon as soon we get good. that up and running. Yeah. But Andre, it's uh, it's Christina dot new life is my um, okay. Instagram page. Dot new life. OK. Yeah. Again. Thank you. I go in and out of that. I don't really I'm not overly active on it. So there's there is some information there, but. So, Christina, it, it was a real pleasure. This is one of the better presentations we've had around this issue. And we have to sincerely thank you for presenting this to us. It's My pleasure. a lot of interest around here. Really, thank you.